My name's Ann Thomas, and I'm the president and CEO of The Children's Place. I love this place. I love that it's about treatment. We come in after an event's happened, and so it's a very specific mental health need, and it allows us to do a lot of quality services because our mission is so concise. You know, when we look at trauma here, it's really an event or a series of experiences that overwhelms a small child and even a family's ability to handle it. It typically is scary or unpredictable, but no matter what it is, it leaves a person feeling helpless. And that's the part that I think we come in with the ingredients of how to help a child and their parents not feel helpless anymore. How can they um, develop skills that will help them feel that they're in control and have a better understanding of maybe why things happened? You know, our population continues to change as the mental health awareness changes in our community. For our day treatment program, about 95% of those children are in foster care and have experienced on average seven different traumatic events. So these are children that have had multiple experiences very early on. So that's 50 kids um, that are enrolled at any given time and each year we serve between 80 and 90 children in that program. We originally were serving just children in foster care who'd experienced abuse and neglect that were coming in for one hour a week. But that has completely changed over the last five, 10 years. We're seeing more and more children who've been adopted. And we're also seeing a lot of children who are living with their biological parents, but going through adverse experiences. We see children coming in where there's been significant divorces. We're seeing more and more children that are being sexually abused by people in the community. Addiction is the other large kind of piece that a lot of children are coming out of homes where there's addiction issues. And then violence. So that demographic goes from people, um, you know, living in a lower socioeconomic to families that are upper middle class that are just seeking mental health services. My name is Rudy Liggins. I'm one of the co-teachers here at the Children's Place. I have the preschool classroom, which means I work with kids three and four. And I've been here almost 42 years. I'm originally from Kansas City, and I coached the freshman basketball team at Texas Tech, and then they canceled the team. So I was out of a job. <laughs> so I came back here to visit my parents because I hadn't seen them in a year. My father and I were sitting on the porch and I was looking through the warn ads and I saw they were looking for teachers for a treatment center for abused kids and this was in 1978. I wasn't naive, but I didn't know what that, that meant. Then as I started working with the Children's Place, I would go out in the community and talk to different people and I quickly found out that a lot of the community didn't know what that meant either. I think the first week we had maybe nine or 10 kids we quickly found out that everything that we prepared for, we were not prepared for. Our kids, developmentally, they were significantly delayed in cognitive skills and language and social and fine motor skills. I was working with four and five-year-old kids that didn't know their colors or shapes or the basic concepts that you would think four and five-year-old kids would know. They didn't know at all. So we almost had to revamp our whole curriculum because uh, the kids were a lot more delayed than we thought. No one really spent time with them on simple things that we take for granted to get them ready to move in the kindergarten. A lot of the kids didn't have a positive male role model, so I wanted to make sure that I provided that to, to the kids. Because I'm so tall, I tried to make sure that when I talked to them that I got down on their level. I didn't ever want a kid to look up at me while I was talking to them. So I made sure that I got on their level and I made sure that we maintained eye contact because a lot of kids been talked at, but not to. I think what is unique about us is that we not only treat the behaviors, we treat the developmental. Every kid is different, you know, no matter what kind of abuse or trauma, it affects everybody differently. 
My name is Krista Kassler. I am a child and family therapist in our counseling program here at the Children's Place. I work with kids two to eight years old who've experienced some form of trauma. Peter Levine is a trauma researcher and he gives us this definition that trauma is anything that is too much, too fast, too soon, or too little for too long. So a lot of the work that we do is repairing and restoring those relationships with their caregivers. The most common kind of trauma that I see in my office is some form of a relationship trauma. At some point, there was a boundary violation or a withholding that really impacted the little one who needed that caregiver to help them in some way. A lot of times people would assume that trauma would be like a physical injury or a neglect, but it can be really subtle miscommunication between a parent and a child over a period of time. Things that we think kids will bounce back from, like a divorce or a separation or a move, can actually be really big changes that are difficult for kids to manage on their own. Fortunately, there is a lot more research coming out with the ACEs study and with the work of Dr. Bruce Perry about the long-term effects of these wounds that are kind of invisible at the time that they're happening. Imagine holding something and you're not holding it with your hands, you're holding it with your insides. And now imagine living that way for years, holding this, this heavy thing that seems unshareable. And then, you know, talking about the long-term effects of physical, medical symptoms that follow. So much of the work traditionally has been working on the cognitive side of things. How do we think about this instead of how do we feel and embody this? Speech and language have often been looked over by care providers. A lot of our kiddos, they, um, their families are worried about putting food on the table. Their families are worried about the next paycheck that's going to come in. They're not sitting at home reading stories and reading books. They're not given opportunities to help with chores or follow directions. A lot of families, even typically developing families, fall into a routine and they just meet their kids' needs when, when they know that they need them. They don't set up those opportunities for language learning. So for our kiddos, they already have had trauma and then their environment often isn't that language rich environment. It's kind of always that heightened, you know, what's going to happen type of environment. So the fact that we can give them that here and the fact that we not only do group activities, but I have the opportunity for those kids who need it to pull them into individual sessions. I really see a lot of connection and a lot of really good work. With everybody being a part of a trauma-informed team, I feel like it gives everybody the framework to work with our kids. You know, if, if we're correcting a kiddo, we reflect what they're doing back to them, and we try and guide them in a different direction. So it, it gives us a common language, but it also gives the kiddos consistency. One of the things that we know is that children have experienced any traumatic event before the age of five. Their sensory integration is the most affected. So being able to have an environment where the child is not overstimulated with sound and when the walls look a little bit different. For example, all of our playrooms have only the toys that are necessary for them to be able to process their story of trauma. In the classroom, we have had to edit a lot of the materials because when a child comes in and there is colors and papers and sounds and uh, every time that they have to move something and then something tips over can really dysregulate a child to go from a moment of them being able to relate to you to going into dysregulation. So we did a couple of things in two of our older classes. We removed all of the overstimulating things and we left only the basic things that the teachers were going to need. 
having less materials allowed them to ground themselves in a spatial matter that allows them not to be dysregulated. One of the things that we know for children who have experienced trauma is when they have a lot of materials and a lot of choices for them to have, they get dysregulated, especially if they come from an environment when they don't really have a choice. So imagine you're in an environment when you do what you have to do because you have to. There is never any choice. And then you move entirely to an environment. It's like you can be sitting down, you can be laying down, you can be, it's too much. So the environment really needs to set the stage for regulation. Even the lighting, when the child comes into the room, being able to understand this is a, a calming place. Consistency, simplicity, and a routine are really key for children to feel this is a safe space. As adults, it's the same thing. If we have never experienced trauma, we have a window of tolerance for that that says, you know what, I can do this. It's gonna be a little bit wonky, but I can do it. If we have experienced in our childhood a time when we didn't really feel safe, we don't have the capacity to say, I got this. We go directly into what is gonna happen to me if I don't have what I was already used to. Kids that have experienced trauma live that on a daily basis, that sense of I am not safe. And interestingly enough, adults actually have the very same experience. The people that work here are the people I admire most. Everyone that comes here chooses to do it because they want to work with young children that have had life's deepest hurts. They're full of grit. They have a strong belief in hope. It is hard, hard work. I know at times we've given everything we can and it still feels like it's not enough. But what I think is missed sometimes by staff is really being able to see the nuancing of how much a child changes in the presence of our adults. And I wish we could do videos of every child on the first two days when they start and then show them later. Because when you're in the thick of changing things, sometimes we lose sight of what the baseline was. And as an administrator, it's constantly reminding the team of what changes have happened and helping to take a step back. Look at that. Oh yeah, I remember that child, when they ran in the room, they wouldn't even acknowledge anyone. And now they say hi to everybody. That's a win. And, and helping kind of see the little wins. And then those little wins over time create big change. Thank mm -hmm. you.